Hello, happy Sabbath, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to this wonderful Sabbath day. Hasn't God not been good? Yes, he has. And we're here to welcome you to this wonderful day that we can worship, that we can fellowship, and that we can meditate in his presence. We would like to extend a special welcome to our churches, our Lake Paris Seventh Adventist Church, our Paris 5th Street Seventh Adventist Church, and all our visitors who are joining us today. May you be blessed and receive the word of the Lord in song and in word, and may your heart be full as you share his goodness with others. Be blessed and have a wonderful Sabbath.
Hello friends, and this is the best part of the worship service because this is the moment for us to give. And one of my favorite gospel songs says, you can't beat God's giving no matter how hard you try. Because the more you give, the more he gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really true that you can't beat God's giving. So why don't you try God in this? Give generously, give courageously, and give cheerfully. If only there was a road map, the kind that I could whip out and follow the directions to for whatever my destination was, that I could choose the destination, and then I could map my journey. If only it was that easy. There was back in the day, what many of Bible workers used to use was the Tom's Guide. And it was a map that seemed to have had directions to everywhere. It didn't matter what city you were going to. It didn't matter what state you were in. If you pulled out a Tom's Guide, you could probably find a map that would hone in on a particular area that you were trying to get to. The amazing part was once you chose your destination, it was so clear the path right before you that you knew when to turn and make a left, when to make a right. You knew the distance that you were going to have to travel from one leg of the journey to the next until you finally arrived at your destination. That's been some days. Then the advancements of what was known as TomTom. Tom. It was an advanced GPS navigation system that, again, you found your destination. But, but, but this one did not give you every route ahead of time. Essentially, you plugged in your destination and it picked up your current location. And then it gave you turn by turn directions. Come on, somebody remembers that. But then those extra devices weren't necessary because soon our phones had more up-to-date information even than the expensive upgrade navigations in our cars. So fancy some of our phones that we don't even need to type the information on the digital screen like a Tom Time, but we could actually say, hey Siri, take us to such and such. Now you know the amazing thing is that we don't often double check whether or not Siri is actually right. We just trust that when it says for us to turn left, we turn left. And when it says in 2.3 miles, we're going to turn right at the point that we get there, usually right around 300 feet away, it begins signaling us to get over to the other side of the road to make sure that we don't miss our turn. We have this innate ability to trust our technology that it's going to take us by whatever route it needs to take us even if it makes real-time adjustments, like my favorite app, Waze, that it's going to get me there in the best possible route with the most efficient time, with the least amount of unnecessary turns. Can you imagine if we gave God that same kind of trust? That no matter what detour came up, that we trusted, because we've already accepted him as our Lord and Savior, and that our destiny, destination has already been plugged in by our choice in accepting him. That heaven essentially is our goal. And that we didn't question whether or not he knew the route. <laughs> Why? That's his house. Like, we're going to be with him. Essentially, we should trust him the same way we trust our navigations. So when we pray, we should enter these moments differently. Because no matter what variables and unexpected turns have arrived, no matter what intrusions have come into what was our peaceful 2020, we should know that we've already plugged in the destination. He knows the best route. Our job, just like with Siri, is to simply follow. 
Would you today? I didn't get that. Could you try Pray that? with me. God, today we come. I didn't we come today, God, simply hoping to be able to have the kind of trust, the kind of relationship with you where we don't have to worry about our terms. But God, we don't have to worry about when to turn left and when to turn right. That we, God, don't have to worry about figuring out the path because you've already done that. And what I love is not only did you figure out the best route for each one of us to journey, but you even make real-time adjustments when necessary. And generally those adjustments aren't because of ancillary or peripheral, but rather often they're because of our own actual issues, indecisions or disobedience. But you still are continuing to make the adjustments to ensure that our route is the best possible route, that we will arrive at the kingdom in the best possible manner that we might be able to receive our keys to the kingdom. Now, while it's not always easy to just follow, sometimes the challenge is definitely in simply trusting your way because we don't see you. So, Father, I pray today that you would bless all of us who have challenges at times, trusting that you know exactly what you are doing. And we don't actually need to question whether or not you've got the best path lined up for us. I know sometimes the challenge is that our path and our journey has bumps along the road that sometimes cause us to question because of our own issue of independence, whether or not had we done it our way, that there would be less detours and less bumps in the road, maybe less roadblocks and less unexpected turns. But the truth is, you've already vetted every possible route. And you're just looking for a people that would simply trust and obey. You're looking for those, God, who would simply follow to ensure that the path that they are on is the best path that can be taken. So God, be with us as we journey not just towards your way for us, but as we journey towards trusting you because of our own challenges. So forgive us, God, where we've disobeyed and not done what you've asked. Forgive us, God, where we did not trust that you knew what you were doing. So let it be today that we make a shift in our perspective. Not in the way that we see life, but just in the way that we see you. As it pertains to life and us. So Lord, I pray that with ever, every turn that was contrary to your hope for us, that, Father, you indeed would forgive us of all of our sins. Bless this morning, I pray, that for those who are struggling with high levels of anxiety and worry, for those who are fearful about living the light that you've called us to because of this coronavirus, for those who are worried about family, friends, and loved ones, for those who are unable to find a sense of peace and even clarity of purpose. God, I pray that you would hear every wounded and broken heart, every cry, and every hurt and pain, every hope and every joy. God, every victory and celebration. Lord, let it be that all of our were stuff the good and the not so good, that you would hear and respond. That we indeed might better be able to reflect you as we release the unnecessary baggage we carry to pick up the peace that's everlasting. That our light might so shine even brighter than ever before because of the regained hope that we've found in you. This God, we thank you and love you for. And we will be mindful and careful 
to give you all the praise that you deserve for the ways that you showed up and the ways that you show up. In Jesus' name, together we pray. Amen. I'm so confused. I know I heard you loud and clear, so I follow through. Somehow I ended up here I don't want to think I may never understand That my broken heart is a part of your plan When I try to pray, all I've got is hurt And this forwards It was in 1996, yeah, that's way back now, that I entered Oakwood College right in Huntsville, Alabama, coming from here, the big state of California. Not sure what to expect. Matter of fact, even the chosen, the pre-chosen study course that I have changed because I had no idea what God was going to do. But God calling me to the ministry and to study theology is a whole nother sermon all in itself. While there, one of the notable professors that made an impact on me 
was a professor by the name of Dr. Mozak. Dr. Mozak would often tell us that he was from a little island called Bekwe. At least that's how I think you pronounce it. Sounded like when he would describe it that it was the size of Loma Linda right around this big. Dr. Mozak was no joke. He's passed on now, or else I would encourage everybody to pick up at least one class from Dr. Mozak, because he just had a way about him. Dr. Mozak would always establish who he was very early in class. Dr. Mozak, on his office, when you would go to visit him, had a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper turned in portrait mode. And on the paper, it said, it's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and receive all shadow of doubt, remove all shadow of doubt. <laughs> he also had another quote on the outside of his door. The outside of his door, this quote, this other quote said, grace is for salvation, but works, but grades are by works alone. He wanted to make sure that we knew as young budding theolo theology students, some going the route of Bible worker and others going the route of religious teacher. And then some like myself, the route of becoming a pastor, being a preacher. He wanted to know that when it came to him, don't play. And it was crazy because Dr. Mozak had a way of loving you with a strong love. That if it was all said and done, that you knew that he loved you. But boy, it sure was hard to know that. But he pushed you to make sure that he got the best out of you. But he loved you just like you were. <laughs> Dr. Mozak was an amazing professor. That most of those who ever came through his class, no matter how many classes that you took, all it took was one or two classes. And you never forgot who Dr. Mozak was. He was just that memorable. Our text jumps in to guiding people to being careful, being careful with their ways and beings and especially the very things that come out of their, their mouth. Romans, the 14th chapter, here in the first verse, it reads this way. As Paul is writing to the big church in Rome, he says, accept other believers who are weak in the faith. Don't argue with them about what they think is right or is, is wrong. Verse 2, he gives an example. He says, for instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believe with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Verse 3, he says, those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. For God has accepted them. Verse four, he then comes confrontationally a second time and says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? He begins making a shift into a, another example of sorts to highlight the idea of accepting others for who they, who they are. I'd like to preach for just a few moments on the subject entitled, Mama, do I have to? Pray with me if you would. Father, over the next few moments, as we open up your holy scriptures, we ask that we would hear so clearly each one of us, no matter where we are, about what you have for us today. Let, lot, let not my imperfections get in the way of your perfect will for each of us. In this special moment, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. The church of Rome was a powerful church. This particular church had influence, not just locally. But in the big city of Rome, this church was a reflection of the size and the magnitude of this indeed area. The church of Rome was influential in the city, in the community, yea, even in the government. 
People wanted to be associated with the Church of Rome. We're 14 chapters in. When Paul is writing this particular le letter back to the church, and it's interesting, even after 14 chapters in, some seasons later, after he's cultivated the church and the church has produced great spiritual leaders, there's still some challenges that the church of Rome is facing. Can you believe it? That Paul writes this particular letter, particularly addressing the issue of accepting weak believers. And don't argue with them. <laughs> Come on. I have this question that comes to my mind when I read this particular passage and I wonder to Paul, Paul, why in the world would you tell me to accept? I accept everybody. Except for those who disagree with me. I, I mean, I accept I accept everybody. <laughs> but but Paul, you know, I, I know more about God than some people. So it's my job to fix them and make them right. I need to pull out my toolkit of scriptures and I need to be able to break it open and use the right tool for the right job to make sure that those whose screws are a little loose, that it would be me that pulls out my electric screw gun and fixes them. But isn't that my job? As somebody who knows more than other people, isn't it my job to tell them that their skirt is too short? or to tell them that their clothes are too tight? Isn't it my job to tell them that they shouldn't wear jewelry? Isn't it my job to let them know that they're eating the wrong foods? Isn't it my job to police them and write their tickets when they need to and make sure that they show up to the court of my judgment because I'm right and they're wrong? Paul, what do you mean don't judge them? Don't argue with weaker believers. You mean I just got to let stuff go? Come on. You know, with my righteous indignation, it is absolutely my job to police and to secure the church of God. Because woe be unto us if we are not policing and scrutinizing the imperfections and the flaws, the challenges and the shortcomings of others. Isn't it my job? to correct those who step out of line. Isn't that my job? Paul is writing to the church in Rome and he gives them a, a two letter word. No, it's not your job. Wait a, wait a minute. I mean, it's not my job, Paul. Paul says in the first verse, I've got the answer for those that need, think that they need to be the polices in churches. For those that think that they need to always open up their mouth and fix and correct those who are out of place and those who are wrong. He says, except other believers who are weak in the faith. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. It will make me pull my hair out, Paul, if I don't give them the whammy of my knowledge. Because, you know, I'm always ready to debate the wrong of others. If I don't drop my three-point beginning, my intros of my arguments, my bodies that are well-defined, and the conclusion to <laughs> slap them up, for what they don't know. Then whose job is it? Isn't that for me? Paul. In this text gives a spiritual gut check. As to the responsibilities. Of those deeper in the faith those who've been walking with God longer than those who are still learning what it means to be a Christian at its base, still figuring out what it means to walk with God because it's all so new, not just them, but also to the group of those who have lost their way along the way. Those who are committed and consistent, and somehow something interrupted their faith. And they started walking away 
and start sort of walking towards. He's giving a ways in which we need to operate. And that is literally to accept others. Those who are weaker in the faith, because, you know, the truth is those who are weak in the faith make some of the decisions. That would cause us to cringe because they're weaker in the faith. They haven't learned how to trust. They haven't learned how to depend. They haven't learned how to obey. They are weaker in the faith. And Paul poignantly expresses that the job of the believer and those who walk faithfully with God are to accept those who are weak in the faith. And Paul says to shut your mouth. All right, Paul didn't actually say those exact words, but he did say don't argue with them. He did say don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. He does express this sentiment with clarity in order that we would not find ourselves arguing with people who just have not come to where we've come. Because what will it benefit them? And it gives a for instance. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything. But another believer with a sensitive conscience, he says, will eat only vegetables. Yeah, all my vegetarian and vegan buddies, he's coming for you right now. Those who feel free to eat anything must not condemn or look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. God has accepted them. Wait a minute. You, you know, many, many of the vegans and, and vegetarians believe that translation's going to come because these processed foods are not in our system. And that we are going to be at the left and the right hand of God because we've chosen the way of being vegan. Now, nah, you know, that's just an aside. You know, that's just a choice that you've made in order to. With what you've been convicted with. But Paul is challenging even the eaters of food. For those who think that they're more righteous because they don't go to McDonald's because they don't get those French fries and they don't get biscuits sopped up in lard. Yeah, you know, many of people think that they're more righteous because of what goes into their mouth. Watch what the text says. That it is not by virtue of those who walk in the landscape of this created earth. To judge those who have different choices. And just for clarity's sake, this essentially is just an example that Paul is using. This is what's called a hypothetical situation, that it's actually not about food, that the root that Paul is getting some at is something totally different. He continues on in the second clause of the third verse, and he says those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. He flips the scenario. And says that God has accepted them. Verse four, he provi provides now another, for instance, or hypothetical. He says in verse four, he says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. He almost says in this particular text, as he's using this example, Mind your business. I know that sounds a bit confrontational, but look at the words of Paul. As I simply contemporize the, this idea that he's suggesting, mind your business. Some might even say, mind your own soul. It says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? He actually begins here drawing this picture of master and servant. When he says that their own master will judge whether they stand or fall, they, the servants, to this particular master. And there begins to draw this apocalyptic eschatological imagery here in this text as to that of the coming of our Savior. When he says, and with the Lord's help, 
they will stand and receive approval. He jumps from calling the head of the servants from master. Now he calls them Lord. He introduces a different word that we know for those who believe. Identifies this part with the coming savior. Now watch in the text here when he swaps the word. Because essentially he starts by saying, who are we to judge another master's servants? Those who serve a different master. And then he says, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Remember in scripture, the Lord has two particular identifications. One is essentially synonymous with a master of a house who has servants. He's the Lord of that house. But it's a beautiful double entendre. Why? Because we recognize the word Lord as redeemer, as kinsman, as savior, our Lord. And if there's a swap from the master of a house to the Lord, then those servants could be swapped with us. So then the idea of not judging one another based on those who will fall or those who will stand, it's only up, as the text suggests, to the Lord of those servants. Come on, come on, you got to be feeling me now. The Lord of those servants. And watch how compassionate is the God of our salvation. He does not leave us unto our own decisions. But the text, he says that the Lord will help. They will stand and receive his approval. Essentially, the God who will judge our living is the same person who will be our advocate in the courtroom. That we will not stand unto our own demise when judgment day comes, but rather the lawyer in the courtroom that will be fighting on our side is the same one that will be helping make the decisions. So we almost have a cheat sheet. We've almost been gifted with this amazing position that we stand not unto our own accord. But rather the one in the courtroom who's fighting for us is also the same one who's accepting and embracing us. And why does it matter? Here's why it matters. It's because verse 10 challenges us in chapter 14 to never look down on another believer. Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. And the same grace by which we have measured others worthiness. The Bible says it's the same measure by which we will be judged. So essentially, when Paul is writing with the inspired pen to the church in Rome, He is saying that day like he's saying today with the same acceptance that we desire to receive from God is the same acceptance that we must render to others. That the spaces by which the less spiritual, the less saved, the less faithful are to experience the depth of love from Christ And from his children is the same that you desire to receive from him. So let us in these moments be careful about how we treat others that may not be as spiritual as we are, that may not be as convicted and committed, may not show up as often as we do to the church or to service, to outreach. Let us be careful of the ways in which we communicate because we are always communicating on behalf of Christ. Let us be careful that we don't run them out the church when they are seeking to run in the church. Let it not be the peripherals by which we judge others. Let it not be anything by which we judge others. 
Let us be careful that we don't whip out the police tools and begin writing tickets to others, believing that it's our responsibility to fix their brokenness. And let us let God have his way with them as God has been having his way with us. Lest we ever forget, no matter how much of the Bible we know, no matter how long we've been walking faithfully, no matter how many things that we can quote, no matter how many suits we wear and ties that we tie, no matter how long our skirt or how low our heels, that we are also in need of a redeemer, that we are in the gravest and greatest need of the blood of Jesus, lest we think that we can do it all by ourselves. Father, today, we pray to be a people, far and wide, active or not, faithful or not, that simply share the light and the love of Jesus with others. And yes, that is enough. Give us hearts that are contrite and careful. Give us minds that are introspective and honest. Let our love be felt on your compassion received. Teach us that just because we think it doesn't always need, mean it needs to be said. Let us walk with the obedience of the almighty Savior carefully and with wisdom. We love you, God, and are looking forward to your soon coming. But while we are still here, I pray that we would be a people that reflect the amazing image of Christ Jesus to all that we come in contact with. This God we pray in your holy and righteous name. Amen. What a blessing that I pray that each one of you will experience the overwhelming grace of our Lord and Savior. We thank you for tuning in wherever you find yourselves these days. To stay connected, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I want to encourage you to give as God has given to you financially and with your time that we may be the change that we desire to see in this world till we meet again.
Instead of asking why